It's my great pleasure to welcome tonight Dr. Gene Smith. He's come to us before. We're very happy to have him. He is a professor in the Department of History at TCU. He teaches undergraduate and graduate level courses on early American history. He's written, edited, or co-authored several books on aspects of naval and maritime history, the War of 1812 being one of his specialties, and early American territorial expansion. His book, Filibusters and Expansionists, explores early American expansion across the Gulf South into Texas, and his new book deals with the War of 1812 and a study of African American combatants. He is also co-authoring <clears throat> co a military history of the United States. Additionally, he has received internal research awards from Montana State University Billings and TCU, as well as fellowships from the Henry E. Huntington Library, the Virginia Historical Society, the U.S. Department of the Navy, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, and from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And we're especially uh, excited to have him tonight because we're the first group locally here to get to hear him speak on this. And his new book is out right now, and he has them for sale at the back for $20. So, uh, Gina, I bring it over to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight in this rain. I know it's, it's not fit weather for animal or beast or human or, or anyone. Uh, and as I was coming in tonight, it seemed like every crazy person on the road was in front of me but we made it one way or another. Now, I want to start by asking a couple of simple questions. And I think being a, someone who's interested in genealogy, being someone who's interested in history, we always begin with a question. And it's that question that tends to drive us to the point of insanity at times. Because we're always looking for the answer to that one question. Now. I began this project here in the late 1990s, and it was a very simple question. I had a student in an undergraduate class who asked me, he said, well, in terms of the War of 1812, who did the slaves side with? And I said, well, I'm not sure. And I said, well, maybe I need to figure that out. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll just do some background reading. I'll you know, look up a couple of books, a couple of articles, and then next thing I know I'll be able to answer this student's question. Well, when I started doing that, there was no answer to it. No one had really kind of addressed this question. And as I looked into it, it made me curious because what I found out is that slaves sided with the Americans, slaves sided with the British, you know, this is the second Anglo-American War. So, sided with the Americans, sided with the British. Slaves sided with the Spanish. Wait a minute. Why the hell did the Spanish come into this? They're not in the war. Slaves sided with the Native Americans. And then slaves also joined mulatto communities. So, they were hedging their bets on all fronts. And why did some join the Americans? Why did some join the British? Why did some join the Spanish? That became the question that I wanted to answer. And 15 years later, you know, I finally came to that answer. And what I'd like to do is kind of tell you some stories. And they're biographical stories. They're biographical. I thought I was loud enough that you could hear me anyways. Uh, yeah, that's okay. They're biographical stories because I am convinced that too often we forget history is about people. People who lived, people who died. And too often when historians write about the past, somehow they leave people out of the story. You know, it's institutions, or it's government, or policy, or, or war writ large, and it's the people who are living and dying. So that's the way I came at this project, to try to understand people. And I'll throw some names out at you and see if any of these names resonate with you. Have you ever heard the name Peter Dennison? No? Didn't think so. What about the name Prince Witten? W-I-T-T-E-N. No? 
What about the name Charles Ball? That's a name some people may have heard because he, he did write an, an autobiography in the 1840s. Uh, what about the name Ned Roberts? No. A name you may have heard is the name Jordan Noble. The reason, when I gave, I gave this talk in New Orleans, I gave it four different times over the course of a week. And, of course, everybody down there knows the name Jordan Noble because he was the drummer boy who served with Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans. And he has become synonymous with the Battle of New Orleans. And his drum from later in life is in the Cabildo Museum, the State Museum there on Jackson Square. So you can go in and see Jordan Noble's drum. So when I mention Jordan Noble, everybody says, oh, yeah, I, I know Jordan Noble. But all of these are African-American men. They were all men who were faced with making a choice. Who would they side with? The Americans, the Brits, the Spanish, or whom? Well, in trying to answer these questions, I, in essence, have six mini-biographies. And I... I try to tell you what happens with them so that you can see how individuals made choices. And then I put them or weave them into the larger story of what's going on during the War of 1812. So that by the end, hopefully you can see that individuals make choices. Those choices often affect groups as a whole. And... Ultimately, what they were trying to achieve was some ultimate goal. So let me tell you a couple of stories that came out of this book. And with each one of these stories, it was mounds of genealogical research that got me to the point where I was able to tell this story. Now, the name Peter Dennison, the first one I mentioned, it doesn't surprise me you haven't heard of him because he was actually from the Detroit, Michigan area. At the end of the... 18th, the early part of the 19th century, he was a slave. He had been owned by a lady, and the lady was having hard financial times, so she offered to indenture her slave to a free white man with the promise that he would pay the indenture, and after a period of time, the slave would be granted his freedom. Well, that was the, quote-unquote, the agreement. But as the time neared for the slave to be granted his freedom, his female owner reneged on the agreement. And it becomes a court case, a fairly lengthy court case in Michigan Territorial Court. So here is how I started stumbling across Peter Dennison because he was in the legal proceedings. And of course, when you have a legal case, there's going to be extraneous material that comes in and helps you fill in the picture. Well, what happens with Peter Dennison is that he's not given his freedom. And in 1807, there's an event that happens during the summer of 1807 off the coast of Virginia. It's called the Chesapeake Leopard Affair. When a British warship made an unprovoked attack against an American warship. And the reason is because the British commander wanted to impress a group of sailors that the commander believed and claimed were British subjects. So they stopped the American warship. They forcibly boarded the American warship. They mustered the crew and they identified four men that they claimed were British subjects. Now, what most people did not know is that of these four men, three of them were black men. And the British claimed these three black men were British subjects. All three of them claimed to be Americans. Well, this episode is seen as a contributing event to the second war with Great Britain. 
So in the summer of 1812, I mean, pardon me, the summer of 1807, in the aftermath of this Chesapeake Leopard affair, all of a sudden the nation is gearing up on a war footing. And in the remote land of Detroit, Michigan, the governor there, William Hull, he doesn't have any soldiers, so he is trying to conscript militia. And he permits Peter Dennison to form a black company of militia. And they begin training on the, the village green, and they are well disciplined, they are efficient, they are model soldiers. Well, the war scare subsides by the end of the year, and the militia is dismissed. And it seemed as if that was all of Peter Dennison's story. Well, by 1812, the summer of 1812, the war finally begins. And the first theater of operation is going to be, of course, Detroit, Michigan. And Governor Hull again calls out the militia, and he calls out Peter Dennison, even makes Peter Dennison an officer. And they're there at the defense of Detroit. Well, if you know what happens during the war, Hull surrenders Detroit in late August. And his name is going to be synonymous with Benedict Arnold. In the 19th century, if you said William Hull, it meant treason. Well, what happens to Peter Dennison? Peter Dennison was paroled, and we know that he lived in the area of Detroit during the war. What exactly he did, we don't know. But by the time the war comes to an end, he is living in Sandwich, which is right across the Detroit River near Windsor. And he proclaims himself to be a free man. Now we know this from church records and from local census records in the Canadian archives. What this story about Peter Dennison told us is that in the end of the 18th century, in the early part of the 19th century, when we think of the Underground Railroad, what do we normally envision in our minds? What is the Underground Railroad? It's a trail that leads from south to north, and ideally to the freedom in the north. Well, what the Peter Dennison story told us is that at the end of the 18th, the early part of the 19th century, that Underground Railroad was leading south from Canada into Detroit because all those soldiers, those black militiamen, were runaway slaves from Canada. Now, by the time the War of 1812 ends, that Underground Railroad has flip-flopped all of a sudden, slavery is no longer legal in Canada, and slaves from America began running north, crossing the, the icy flows of the Detroit River to find their freedom. Peter Dennison, he used the opportunity of war, the chaos surrounding war, to cross that river to bring his wife and his four kids and declare himself a free man. That's Peter Dennison's story. Prince Witten. That's another one you guys didn't really know much about. He was born sometime in the late 1750s in uh, South Carolina. He was a slave. We know that by 1780, he had escaped from South Carolina fleeing south to Spanish Florida. And we know that from South Carolina records, and we know that from Spanish records in Florida. You know, the Spanish, the Spanish weren't very good at managing an empire, but they were damn good at keeping records. I mean, they keep records on everything. So it's easy, if you ever have to work in Spanish records, you know, just pat yourself on the back and just find the right collection because they're going to have just about everything you're looking for. 
Well, he escapes to Spanish Florida. Why does he go to Florida? Because the governor there is proclaiming any slave who escapes will be granted their freedom. So, Prince, Prince Whitten, who was a carpenter, he was able to escape into Florida. He was able to find work because he was a carpenter. And he, his wife, his daughter, his son, began to build a life for themselves. Now in the 1790s, there's a time when there is a threat, an American threat for the inv against the invasion of Florida. And Prince Whitten is right there on the forefront of Spanish lines because the Spanish never had enough troops in Florida. They had a nice, a very nice castle at Castillo de San Marcos or St. Augustine, but they didn't have any men to put in it. So the governor is using any man who was willingly take up a, a weapon. Prince Whitten and other runaway slaves would gladly take up arms for Spain because Spain had granted them their freedom. Well, to fast forward the story, by the time the War of 1812 begins, Prince Whitten owned property. He was a prosperous, merch, uh, prosperous carpenter. His daughter had married a man named Orhe Jacobo, who was the, the brother-in-law of, of uh, Orhe Biasu, who had been one of the leaders of the revolt in Haiti. And because Jacobo was the acknowledged heir to Biasu, he becomes the leader of the black militia, and his father-in-law, Prince Witten, becomes one of, the, one of the commanding officers. And when the War of 1812 begins, even though the United States is not fighting against Spain, remember the War of 1812, Britain, United States. So why do we fight Spain? Well, there's a peninsula there. There was land. And Americans are saying, wait a minute, there's land here that we can take. Spain is weak and crumbling. All we have to do is go down and take it. So Americans invade Florida. That's a part of the War of 1812 that most people don't know about. And who is there on the forefront of the Spanish lines? Jacobo, the black militia, and Prince Whitten. And they literally drive the Americans out. Hold on to Florida for Spain. Hold on to it militarily until 1821. At that point, diplomats finally solved the Florida question. John Quincy Adams, the Secretary of State, he will negotiate with the Spanish foreign minister and secure the acquisition of Florida. What about Prince Whitten? You think he was going to stay in a Florida controlled by Americans? No. He rounded up his extended family and they boarded Spanish ships and they evacuated with the Spanish army. And he would live out his later years in outside of Havana as a free black man in Cuba. So you notice some recurring theme here with Peter Dennison who flees to British Canada and with Prince Whitten who flees to Spanish Florida. What are they looking for? Freedom. That's the answer, that's the million dollar answer right there. Then there's Charles Ball, who some people are shaking their head. Yep, I've heard of Charles Ball. He is a Mar Marylander. He had been born a slave in Maryland. And around 1800 or so, his master had hired him out to the U.S. Navy. He worked aboard an American warship as a cook. And he, at that point in time, he tried to escape to gain his freedom. But his master kind of picked up on the fact that he was trying to escape and called him back to the plantation. 
where apparently, according to Ball, he was poorly treated. He was beaten. He was not clothed properly. And then he does, well, he's actually sold south to Georgia. And Ball claims himself that he escaped his bondage in Georgia and spent a year working his way back to Maryland. When he got back to Maryland, the locals around the neighborhood acknowledged that he was a slave, but they treated him more like a free black. They hired him out to do tasks. And from the money that Charles Ball made, he purchased the freedom of his wife. And they had children that purchased the freedom of those. Charles Ball consciously crafted an idea that he was a free man. That was the idea in his mind, that he was free. Well, by the time the War of 1812 happens, the locals in his neighborhood even acknowledged he was free. And in 1813, the British Navy is operating in the Chesapeake Bay, and they've been ravaging the American coastline. And a group of white plantation owners decide to visit the British fleet to try to get runaway slaves to go back to their plantations. Now, do you think they go? No, they don't go. But they brought Charles Ball with them so they, he could go aboard the ship and mingle among, amongst the slaves and try to convince them to come back. Well, none of them did. But a British officer offered Charles Ball the opportunity to leave to be evacuated with the slaves. And Ball said, why should I go? I'm a free man. He consciously crafted in his mind he was a free man. The following year, he fights with Joshua Barney on the gunboats in the Chesapeake. He's at the Battle of Bladensburg, which is an utter disaster. You know, Bladensburg is just east of the American capital. They, they refer to it as the Bladensburg Races because the militia there basically fired a couple of shots when the British came full front forward. They broke and ran, and they ran all the way to Washington into Georgetown. Well, the one group that stood were the, the black sailors of Joshua Barney's gunboats. They stayed right there at their guns until Barney had been wounded and fell, and he ordered his men to make their way out of the battle. And according to Ball, he melted into the countryside, found his way to Baltimore, where about a month later, he's there helping defend Baltimore against the British attack against Fort McHenry and the uh, land attack against North Point. Well, he's a part of the celebration. <laughs> September 12th in Baltimore is known as Defender's Day. And he was a part of that celebration. He still claimed to be a free man. But about 1830, a slave trader comes forward and captures him, claims that the brother-in-law of his former owner in Georgia had paid for his apprehension, and Charles Ball would be dragged back to Georgia. By the time he made his way back to Maryland, about more than a year later, his wife and his children had been dragged off into slavery. The key to this story for Charles Ball is that he had consciously crafted that story in his own mind that he was a free man. And had he taken the British offer in 1813 or 1814 to be evacuated with other refugees, he would have had his freedom in a British colony. But he doesn't. He spends the rest of his life searching for his family. So, it's kind of a heartbreaking story. But to me, even more of a heartbreaking story is the story of Ned Simmons. Ned Simmons was a slave on General Nathaniel Lyons' plantation on Cumberland Island. Um, I say Nathaniel Lyons, pardon me, Nathaniel Green. Uh, Green was a, a hero of the American Revolution. And in the early 1790s, when 
George Washington visited Savannah. He came to Cumberland Island. He stayed on Green's plantation. And Ned Simmons was a part of the retinue or the party that helped transport the general from, from Savannah to Cumberland Island. He was a slave, but he was a valuable slave. And he was treated reasonably well. But nonetheless, he was a slave. And although he was associated with that revolutionary hero, Ned Simmons decided in January of 1815, when the British landed on Cumberland Island, he decided to throw off his shackles and join with the British. He was one of the first slaves on Cumberland Island to decide that he would enlist in the British Colonial Marines. He made his mark on the muster roll. He was given a red uniform. He was given a weapon. He was taught to drill. And he stayed there on Cumberland Island to be an example to other slaves that made it to the island that they too could carry a weapon and fight for his his Majesty King George III. The fact that he stayed there on Cumberland Island as an example ultimately proved to be his downfall. Because by mid-February 1815, the two sides had agreed to a peace in Jan or pardon me, De uh, Christmas Eve 1814. By mid-February, news of the ratification had made its way to the Gulf Coast and to the South Atlantic. And all of a sudden, American Army officers and the British Admiral there, Admiral George Coburn, the man who had burned Washington, they were debating over the question of spoils of war. And finally, Coburn has to agree that any seized property that is still on the island on February 15th, 1815, has to be returned. Ned Simmons was still on the island. So he is stripped of his red uniform, his weapon is taken from him, and he is placed back into slavery. That's not the end of his story, though. He lives as a slave for the Green family to the 1830s, and then he sold to another family. He lives to the American Civil War. And in February of 1863, he and his daughter will find their way through Confederate lines to Union Control Florida, where he will finally be granted his freedom. And he's a centenarian at this point, 100 years old. There was a newspaper reporter there who interviews him. And he learns to read as a centenarian a group of philanthropists there helped teach him to read. And only a couple of months after he learns to read, he is a free man. He dies. The sadness of his story is that he had lived such a long life that he survived long enough to gain that freedom that he had wanted back in 1815, but didn't have. To me, that's the heartbreaking story of the book because he waited so long and when he finally did get his freedom, he doesn't have a real chance to enjoy it. And then the last of these stories is about Jordan Noble, the drummer boy, who was a slave from Augusta, Georgia, makes his way to New Orleans about 1814 and he enlists in the U.S. Army. Somehow, from the point he enlisted in 18. Uh, 1814, we don't know if he's enlisted as a free man or as a slave, but he is a drummer boy and he serves with Jackson throughout the New Orleans campaign. On January 8, 1815, the main British attack at Chalmette, he is there beating his drum. And a, dr a drummer is not just a, a symbolic piece. When there is a battle going on and there's smoke everywhere and there's sounds, the drum is the, the commands, the orders. So he's beating out the orders to everyone. And he would be acknowledged and recognized for that. Andrew Jackson acknowledged him and recognized him for that. 
In the years that followed, Jordan Noble fought in the Seminole War. He fought in the Mexican War, one of the few blacks to fight in the Mexican War. He even, in 1862, when the Civil War is engrossing and engulfing New Orleans, he initially raises a regiment of free blacks to fight for the Confederacy. Then when Union gunboats come up river and capture New Orleans, he raises a group of free blacks to fight for the Union. He's not discriminatory. But because he had fought for both the Confederacy and the Union, he was going to be proclaimed a patriot who had fought in four wars. And in the years that followed, he became a mainstay, a main feature there in New Orleans society. He and his drum, he was always regaling visitors and playing his drum in 1884-85 when there's the famous New Orleans Exposition. He is one of the primary sites that people came to see. And he would tell stories about how he had served under Andrew Jackson at New Orleans and under Zach Taylor in the Mexican War. When he dies in 1890, the New Orleans Picayune runs a full article about his death. And they even put a woodcut engraving in the newspaper. They call, they, to the time he died, he would always be called the drummer boy. Even though he was 90 years old, he was still the drummer boy. But what we have in the stories of all these people is their desire to have some agency, to make some decision, to make some choice. Those who tried to flee like Ned Roberts, I mean, pardon me, like uh, Ned Simmons, how many ultimately gained their freedom? Well, we know that there's between 4,500 and 5,000 slaves who left the coast of America, boarded British ships, found their way to Bermuda, the first holding depot, and then would be shipped to British Canada, Halifax, or shipped, some were shipped to Trinidad. Here is another sad part of the story. You know, when they first began shipping slaves off the coast of America, they're offered the chance to be shipped to the Caribbean. And these slaves say, no, thank you. We know there's slavery in the Caribbean. We don't want to go there. We'll go up to Canada. You know, we know there's no slavery up there. You know, it's kind of cold up there. Watch the Weather Channel. It's very cold up there. Well, they get up there and they find out exactly how cold it is. And they have to eke out an existence. And in 1818 or so, a group of about a thousand of them decide they're going to leave Canada and go to Trinidad. At least it'll be warmer there. But the rest didn't choose to go because they were scared they would be re-enslaved. The ones who end up going cannot read and they cannot write. So when they get to Trinidad, the governor places them in the interior of the island and they carve out a, an existence in the jungle. You know, uh, living in the middle of the jungle is like fighting an, a battle day in and day out because the jungle tries to grow back over you. Well, because they could not read or write, they were never able to send messages back to their family and friends in Canada and say, hey, at least it's not cold here. <laughs> the ones in Canada thought they had been re-enslaved. So what we find out is that those who fled did so because of their desire for freedom. Those who chose to stay Many of them consciously crafted ideas in their mind that they were free men. Or like Jordan Noble, they became significant enough local features of the community that although they had been slaves at one time, they were treated as free people. But the, those who remained behind did not have the chance to improve their situation. In fact, what happens is the War of 1812 really is a defining point in American racial history. We normally think the American Civil War is that defining point. Well, the War of 1812, once the war is over, 
There are lands all across the Gulf South, Alabama, Mississippi, eastern Louisiana, present-day Arkansas, eastern Texas. These lands are going to be opened up, and it becomes the heart of what we ultimately will call the Old South, the plantation, agricultural, slave-holding South. So the War of 1812 actually reinforces slavery. And the hope and expectation that the war would broaden attitudes and liberal franchise just never happens. So as you read this book, hopefully you will read it, what you'll see is the story of individuals who really had choices to make. And there's still a few other choices I'm not going to tell you about. So I'll go ahead and stop there. God, I talked too long. You should have, should have flagged me off. Once I start talking, I just kind of keep rambling. It's uh, questions. Well, it, yeah, tell us about your researching. Uh, okay. And especially NARA. Uh, okay. How much did you do? How much can you do at home? Uh, okay. The kind of work at this project here is it's got research from all over the world in it. And there is a pretty substantial portion of it that comes from NARA. It begins with census records. It begins with um, army records and naval records and court records, uh, land office records, petitions, uh, uh, veterans petitions. Many of the, much of that stuff you can get online. Other parts of it, they have not. Put online. I mean, anytime you go into pension records or you go into army letters or you go into naval records, those things just have not been digitized. Will they ever be digitized? My guess is probably not. Um, and a lot of the microfilm, you know, NARA had a lot of that microfilm. I hate to tell you that NARA no longer has that microfilm. They ended up divesting themselves of it. Fortunately, it didn't leave town. Uh, we convinced them to give it to TCU. Really? So, oh, yeah. They brought us six huge pallets that were... They wrapped it up with the shrink wrap. Uh, there's probably five, six, seven thousand 7,000 rolls of microfilm. Uh, pardon? Uh, foreign uh, State Department records, War Department records, Naval Department records, Land Office records. I mean, most of the microfilm that they had that was not census-oriented, they ended up getting rid of. Uh, and you can ask Meg about what things they kept. And they didn't, you know, because they, they have a storefront down there, and that's about all they have. So they didn't keep, they didn't keep very much. So... I used a lot of that stuff. Uh, when, you, you know, when you start building these stories about individuals, you have to kind of cobble together sources that give you the details of their life, but also fleshes out what's the context around them. And what the, the most useful thing I found was probably court records. You know, court records are just a gold mine because most people aren't really willing to sit down and kind of ferret through court records. But court records are great because if there's any assets or any question of monetary value involved, you know, there's always going to be some, um, some schedule of what the property in question is. And that's just, you know, that's the kind of stuff you just can't find anymore. Uh, and if you, if you have a chance to work in local records, Local records, um, tax records, um, property records. Um, depending on where you're at, there's also a number of assurance society companies. Assurance societies were the 19th century equivalent of insurance companies. And when you start dealing with their records, you, you never know if they, they have what you're looking for. It's always a hit or miss. But if it's a hit... Wow, it can be a, a, a gold mine. Something else, how many of you have worked in the, uh, 
Oh, God, I'm having a mind freeze here. Um, this is the, um, the records. They're Civil War era records, but they're the records of the property claims against the uh, federal government from Confederates who evacuated their property. Uh, this is actually very useful because you had to document everything that you had because if you're claiming that the army confiscated it or if the army destroyed it, you know, you need to have a record of what it was. Well, and that's what I found that a lot of times the, you end up going through these records and they talk about each individual slave that they had. And that's where I was able to find some evidence later. Now, there's a group, of those, those slaves that ended up in Trinidad, there's still a group of them, or the descendants of them, that are in Trinidad today. They call themselves Merkins, M-E-R-I-K-E-N-S. And they have, they have uh, their own family records, and they have their own uh, oral traditions. So, you know, when you, when you start looking for a project like this, and looking at it, it really encompasses just about any kind of record that you can imagine. And it's just a matter of to what extent will you go to, to get that record. And after 15 years, I went to far too many extents to, to find these things. Yes? Almost every black in the, the, in the Caribbean is descendant of escaped, escaped slaves. There may be some few, but almost all of them are. Well, now, the problem is, on individual Caribbean islands, you had slaves that were brought in. And the slaves that were brought in and those who survived and their descendants, um, when slavery is, when slavery is, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? When it's done away with, abolished. abolished. That, that's a good word, abolished. <laughs> That one just, just kind of pop, couldn't pop up there. When slavery is abolished, uh, those slaves who had been in bondage are emancipated and given their freedom. So they're not escaped slaves. But you do have, you do have in the instance of Barbados and Trinidad and Bermuda, there are individual islands where there is an influx of runaway or what the British called them was refugees. You know, St. Kitts and Nevis is the same way. Yeah. And, and, and they, they uh, killed all the Korean Indians that were there. I mean, they actually killed them and took over the land themselves. Okay. Yes? So in all this, the 44 to 5,000 that the Brits did take out, uh, they never took any to England? It was always... Uh, no. No, they... Uh, it, they're... The Brits are very efficient at logistics. When I was working on this project, I kept seeing those UPS commercials where they were singing about logistics. And I was thinking, God, UPS got it from the Brits. I mean, the Brits were, they were loading their ships with cargo, with food and supplies and, and uh, soldiers and all this, the accoutrements needed for war. And they were taking those ships they were stopping at Bermuda, getting additional water, and then they were coming to the coast of America, and the troops would offload, and all the equipment would offload. And then all of a sudden, the slaves would be funneled back into the boats. The boats would go back to Bermuda, get more water, they'd go back to England. Uh, or they would take those slaves home to Canada. They never took them to, to England. They kept them either in Canada, or uh, they sent those to, uh, to Trinidad, Bermuda, there's a group that is sent to, uh, to Belize on the coast of Amer uh, South America, or Central America, I mean. And then there was a group that is sent to Barbados as well. Another question you had about um, the first guy you spoke with, Denison. Uh, Peter Denison. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you said his case was being tried in Mississippi Territory? Um, Michigan. Oh, I thought you said Mississippi Territory. Not Michigan. Michigan, yeah. I, I couldn't tie the two together <laughs> because when you said Detroit, yeah, well, maybe I said Mississippi. Well, Miss Michigan. Michigan. Well, yeah. but, but I was I was shocked. I didn't know there was slavery in Canada or even in the Yes, there was slavery in Canada until 1796. But if there were slaves in Canada in 1796, they were not immediately set free. They were gradually emancipated. 
So the question is, if you were you know, a six-year-old boy in 1796, you would have to wait 25 years before you'd be free. So are you going to wait 25 years, or are you going to cross over the border into Michigan where you would be freed immediately? Because the Northwest Territory did not permit slavery, or so they said, but there was slavery there. Yeah. And then, of course, after the War of 1812, most of those gradual, emission, or, uh, gradual emancipations have terminated. So there's only a handful of slaves in Canada after that. So that's when you start seeing that Underground Railroad flip-flopping and going back to the north. That probably was one of the most surprising things that I found in this entire study. You know, kind of common perceptions that we have in American history. Uh, you always think the Underground Railroad leads north to freedom. Well, yes, it does in the post-war of 1812 period. But in the pre-war of 1812 period, it leads south from Canada into America. And that's, that's kind of a significant, significant point. Other questions? You make them up, I'll make up answers. What's TCU going to do with all that microphone? Uh, much of it is in our current library. Other parts is in our remote storage. We're not, I've been told we're not getting rid of it. Okay. Not exactly available either. Well, it is, but you can't, you can't go in today and say, oh, I need this right now. Okay. I mean, what we're finding is that in this, this electronic age, libraries are just, they're really changing. They're not, they're not immediate service. Uh, much of, many of the stacks now are even being taken off site. They've been running these programs and books that have not been checked out in five years. They're saying we're gonna put them in remote storage. So I'm telling my grad students, you go and find an entire shelf of stuff I work in and go check out every one of them. And then check it out, hold it a couple days, put it back in and go find another shelf and check it out. That way, you know, at least the stuff I'm working on, it, it'll be there. But, you know, that's the thing about when you're, when you're looking for things, you never know what you're going to need until you need it. And when you need it immediately, you can't get it. And that, that's frustrating. Now, fortunately, many of, a lot of, you may have noticed if you can, um, a lot of the things that you want to get, you can often get on Google Books. And that's a very useful site. Uh, and I tell my students that if they're going to get things on Google Books, you know, look at it, make a copy of it, then compare it to the original. Because sometimes there's always some kind of glitz in, in their scanning. Yes? Is there a finding aid for the microfilm collection? National Archives had a, a local finding aid. So ask, ask Meg for it. Yeah. I mean, we basically just took what they had and... Uh, I don't even know how much of that stuff has been unwrapped. I know some of my students have been working in it, and some of it's been unwrapped, but uh, I don't know beyond that. But there is a project to digitize more. Of yes, there is a project to digitize more, but it's generally records that have genealogical significance. So if you're, you know, for example, I work on a project that's dealing with the U.S. Army, I need the, the letters from commanders from Natchitoches, Louisiana. And there'll be 15 rolls of microfilm. They're not going to digitize all of that. Uh, and I think that's probably what's going to happen. And a lot of times, what most people don't realize is like, why would I need that stuff? Well, if you've got someone who ends up in Natchitoches and they're in the military, there's probably muster rolls there and sick reports and all the other kind of things that will help you fill in the story of the person you're working on. Are the records specifically Southwest region? No. Like State Department is just some of the most odd things. You know, the, the consular records from Suriname. Why do we have that? Well, apparently there was a program in the late 60s, early 70s to about the, the late 70s, where archives, the regional archives, they could digitize things, or not digitize, microfilm things, mm 
for the equivalent of about $2 a reel. So some, some uh, regional archives, they just digitized, uh, microfilmed. They microfilmed all kinds of things. And I think ours was one of those that did it. And, I mean, in terms of foreign records, we have, we have just, you name some obscure country, we probably have consular reports or mission reports. I mean, we have probably something that, that relates to them. Other questions? Put in a plug for your Texas. Oh, yeah. Um, what, I'm a professor of history at TCU. Uh, and at TCU, I am director of the Center for Texas Studies. We have uh, Saturday morning workshops that we hold in this room, generally the first Saturday of the month from 1030 to noon. They're designed to make every person think of themselves as a historian whether it's preserving grandmother's quilt or whether it's you know, taking care of the family heirlooms or whether it's preserving photographs or letters or learning about oral history. We, we try to make people think about how you, the individual, can get involved in this stuff. And if you don't do something now to save the fabric of the past, we lose it. How many times have you heard the story about you know, grandmother's stuff went out in the trash? because no one took the time to sit down and go through it. Well, that's what we try to make people aware of how you can prevent that from happening. That's one of my jobs. My other job, I'm the curator of history at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History. So uh, we do all kind of stuff down there too. So, that good enough? Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, thank you. And yeah, if you want a book, if you want a book, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not hawking them, uh, but if you want one, I've got a few copies back here. They are $20. Uh, if you buy it on Amazon, I think it's $16.97 or so. By the time you pay shipping, it's roughly $20. But if you buy it on Amazon, I don't get to sign it for you. No. <laughs>